blue sea invigorates me. The exotic landscape captivates the eye. I find myself enchanted by a new allure each time, making me return again and again. It's the Malay Peninsula, consisting of the three nations of Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. I decide on a train journey to get a closer look at the Malay Peninsula, which is full of sights and activities. Their lives progress at a beat slower than others amid a wonderful natural environment. On the other hand, in the cityscapes, created by a history of suffering, no two things are alike. Thus, every day is full of festivities, where there is no room for boredom. The Malay Peninsula, the gateway between East and West, has also been called the Golden Peninsula since long ago due to its rich resources. My journey starts in the traveler's paradise, Thailand. The Malay Peninsula is situated between the South China Sea to the east and the Andaman Sea, as well as the Strait of Malacca to the west. The total length of the peninsula alone is over 1,100 kilometers. My Malay Peninsula journey begins in southern Thailand and continues to Malaysia and Singapore. My first destination is Nakhon Si Tamarat. Thailand, in the heart of Southeast Asia, has a 2,600 kilometer coastline and is home to the River Kwai, which proves that it is truly a land of water. There is another thing you can't leave out when talking about Thailand. It's the large and small temples. This shouldn't come as a surprise, as 90% of its citizens are Buddhist. I was a bit concerned because of the things I heard on the news about Thailand, but the city actually looks the same as it did when I came last year. If anything has changed, it's that there are more yellow Buddhist items than usual. I'm on my way to the largest of the six temples. Isn't experiencing the religion a way of understanding a country's culture? Then, I accidentally encounter an unusual procession in the street. People are dancing as they walk, holding a yellow strip of cloth that is so long I can't see the end. All sorts of different instruments combined with traditional Thai music to create a merry mood. It turns out that today is Maka Bucha Day, a festival held just one day a year. Everyone dances and shares the joy as this is a festive occasion. The closer I get to the temple, the larger the procession of yellow cloth carried by people from all around. They are all headed to Waramahawihan Temple in the center of the city. Built in the 8th century, this is one of the oldest temples. There are over 50 small pagodas that surround the principal white stupa, which is called a chedi. Buddha relics are said to be enshrined in the chedi, 
and it is a famous temple that even appears on the face of a Thai coin. Worshippers wind the yellow cloth, which symbolizes gold, around the pagoda three times in prayer. It is out of reverence toward Buddha and his disciples. Not even half the day has passed, and all of the pagodas have thick layers of yellow cloth wound around them. Crowds are bustling, and the Buddhist pagodas are waves of yellow. It is truly the largest temple in southern Thailand. ก็จะเป็นองค์เจดีย์ซึ่งข้างในเนี่ยนะครับจะมีฟันด้านบนข้างซ้ายของพระพุทธเจ้าอยู่นะครับซึ่งที่นี่เนี่ยส่วนยอ
People waiting for the night train is not such an unfamiliar sight. The Thai railway is developed compared to railways in other Southeast Asian countries. The structure is convenient with the platform at ground level. There is the added romance of the conductors going around checking each ticket, too. Beyond the window, a jolting view rushes by and a new day begins. It's been about six hours from Nakhon Sitamarat. I arrive in Patalong after racing through the lush green nature of Southeast Asia. With a population of 40,000, Patalung is one of the top autonomous economic regions among the 76 Thai provinces. In the center is what is referred to as Patalung's heart, the expansive Talinoi Lake. To the east of the lake is Thailand's Eastern Bay. Talinoi is one third the size of Jeju Island in Korea. It is home to over 100 animal species, including buffalo, great black cormorants, common kingfishers, and all sorts of aquatic plants. This is <laughs> 바닷물이 넘쳐 들어와서 막혀서 생긴 큰 호수인데요. 이 크기가 태국에서도 몇안 되는 호수들 중에 하나라고 하네요. Talanoi is renowned for its beauty even in Thailand, which is known as the nation of water. And Talanoi is nicknamed the home of water. 의 stacked wooden tower looks much too perilous for me. I'm going for a closer look. 안녕하세요. Mong refers to the ladder made by linking pieces of wood. The old man made this himself. Yokyo fishing, which uses a mong to catch fish, is a traditional method which dates back to ancient times. He climbs the long ladder-like frame and moves the center of gravity to the tip like a seesaw. A 
wide net that was placed in the lake bed is drawn up. It's more fascinating the more I look at it. I'm suddenly amazed at the wisdom that dates back thousands of years. The people draw up the riches of the lake slowly, as if in slow motion. The Yokyo fishing alone creates a wonderful view of the lake. This region, where the sea and fresh water meet, is one of the most propitious sites on this expansive lake. They usually catch small fish the size of one's palm, anchovies, or prawns year round. The peculiar fishing method, reminiscent of water wheels on salt farms, has stimulated my curiosity. The slightly built elderly man does it well. It will be an embarrassment if I can't. You have to check the net frequently during yokyo fishing. You have to draw up the net every 15 minutes when fishing for anchovies. It's a poor catch because I drew up the net too soon. The trick is to adjust the strength of your wrists and move to scoop the net up and down. <laughs> Among the various fish, apparently these anchovies are a profitable product. <laughs> Back at home, people are busy at work, cleaning the fish that John Moon brought home that morning. They're able to get a good price for them because these fish are hard to find in other regions, and they're quite plump. I'm guessing everyone here is a member of John Moon's family. This is John Moon's younger sister. The woman next to her is his wife, and that's his sister-in-law. In the village, relatives form communities and make a living by farming or fishing. Once the fish have been cleaned, they're dried and stored to make them last for a long time without going bad. However, the way they dry the anchovies is a bit different from the Korean method. Instead of steaming them before drying, they dry them fresh. They dry up nicely in a day and keep well because the sun is so hot. The least amount of cooking produces the best flavor. Isn't this also true in life? Talinoi Lake teaches me what it means to live a simple and modest life. I'm getting a good feeling about this trip from the way it's starting out. 
Tali Noi, which boasts a large scale among lakes in Thailand, looks different according to the depth of the water. This time, I'm going out onto the lake. Thanks to this generous man, it seems I'm going to get a nice tour. The reeds here are famous in Thailand. About one hour since our departure, the deep blue open water disappears and is replaced with a completely different view. The once quiet lake tenses up at the sight of people. As the buffalo and waterfowl let us pass, the reed fields reveal themselves. Green life is dense up against the lake. The wetlands and sand create optimal conditions for them to grow. Among them, reeds, which are green year-round, are the best. They look a bit different from the common reeds that we usually see. They're much shorter, and the reeds are much thinner. <laughs> Kwan comes twice a day to pick reeds. I have to pick only the green reeds, but the thin, spiky reeds aren't easy to pluck with bare hands. To Kwan, the reeds are as important as the anchovies are to the Yokyo fishermen. I agree to follow Kwan, who has spent his entire life on this ocean-like lake. There is a village of about 30 houses that's a 10-minute walking distance from the lake, where Kwan was born and raised. <laughs> Their greeting is short as they're busy weaving baskets. They make them with the reeds from the lake. <laughs> the females of the village usually start making craft work when they enter elementary school. <laughs> Udom Pon has made these handcrafts for 50 years, and it's how she raised her six children. Most of the villagers do manual work like this. The craftwork from this village is so popular that they are considered 
requisite wedding items. The husband picks the reeds and his wife tends to them. How do these rough grassy reeds turn into flat colorful reeds? First, she works mud into them sufficiently. That way they don't crack when they dry. She flattens the dried reeds. What is essential at this stage is a cylindrical stone. With the stone and the added weight of a person, the reeds are flattened out. Kwan and his wife have been making reed crafts for three generations. Before they used this large millstone, they used a wooden bat to beat the reeds flat. Seeing as she is smiling, I must be doing a pretty good job. ตอนนั้นเนี่ยปวดตาปวดตีนะคือเนี่ยจะปวดนะจะปวดอ๋อจะเอาเอาไปก็ได้เหรออ่าเลยเลยอ่าโอเคเลยทะเลน้อยคื
that is green with life year-round. They coexist in their own ways as they rely on one another, and they will continue that way like these rails that lay side by side. The views that I see, the valuable ties that I make, all become life's lessons and will become motifs for the films I will be making. What new things await me in my next destination? The Malay Peninsula gets more interesting as I go on. Ada lagi, jom di sini.